Welcome to Industry 4.0 in Action at Manchester Metropolitan today on the uh, 28th of January. Uh, we're looking forward to a great event. Uh, we've got some great speakers from Bosch Rexroth. We've got a panel interview in the afternoon with people from uh, Airbus, from Autodesk, from Siemens, a local company called Sabisu and a trade organisation called Gambica. And we're really focusing on uh, students and what they need to do from an Industry 4.0 point of view. Uh, to enhance their CVs and what skill sets they might need for the future. And it's really an opportunity for industry and academia to get together to discuss the real needs and challenges that we're facing uh, in our digital age. My name's Dave Chalner, I'm, I lead um, an automation team at Airbus's wing manufacturing plant in Broughton in the UK. Um, and I'm here today with some colleagues to, to participate to the MMU and Industry 4.0 day. Um, in terms of the angle for Airbus, we're, we're promoting our, our ongoing graduate and undergraduate recruitment programme, but also as part of the broader event, we're here to, do, um, to participate with, with partner companies such as Bosch Rexroth, and to see where we are maybe compared to some of those companies, exchange on some of the projects that we have running and hope to start in the next few years. Um, and Industry 4.0 is somewhat still in its immature moments for Airbus at the moment, where we're go looking at going from quite batch production, which is very manually intensive, uh, more pneumatic powered tools than electric. So we're going still through that phase of electrification, digitalization, and ultimately uh, moving towards uh, Industry 4.0, so a bit of a fact-finding and participational day-to-day. -day. Hello, I'm Annette McDonald, I'm Deputy MD of the Chatton Group. We're really excited today to be able to talk about our joint partnership with MMU, where we've been going to be developing what we're calling the CAM Hub, which is a new additive manufacturing factory four facility, which will be situated just outside M Manchester, specifically trying to meet the gap for SMEs who don't have access to technology, skills, and very expensive kit to do some of this disruptive innovation that factory four is all about. So it'll be within a 40,000 square foot development, um, lots of creative space, lots of innovation space, and we're really excited this is going to drive the whole sector forward for the Northwest. Hello, my name is Nick Dryden, I'm from a company called Starla, and we've got a product called FingoPay, which uh, we map the vein, the blood vessels inside your finger, and we turn your finger into useful tools like payment devices, log on to work, um, uh, access all areas in terms of where you are within your factory. Uh, we connect consumers or, or workers straight into the Internet of Things. So uh, Vein ID is one way that we are naturally chipped to better do that. And because it's an internal biometric, it's not susceptible to your hands being dirty or just having washed them. It's completely reliable. We launched this originally uh, as access control into music festivals. Uh, it went down very well. Uh, and now the applications are wide in terms of football stadiums, in terms of workforce management. So, uh, in a football stadium example, it's how, how do you guarantee the provenance of security staff that you're bringing in? What work have they done before? Were they, you know, that historical record of their work uh, and punctuality? Uh, uh, and in terms of security in football stadiums and in uh, high security zones within business and factories, that provenance of an identity carries through. Uh, also enables the staff to then use the uh, canteen facilities because we can attach payment cards, discount vouchers to the fingers uh, to enable that kind of activity also. I'm Andy Gibson, I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Science and Engineering here at Manchester Met and uh, this, uh, I welcome you to this Industry 4 in Action Day. I believe that the hashtag there has is, is already been popular and been forwarded. So, uh, welcome to the day. It's a great pr privilege to open this event and it's my pleasure uh, to put, put the day into some kind of context. So, 
So like every event that I've been to in the last few months, uh, they all start with mentioning Brexit. So I'm, I'm going to mention Brexit, but I'll quickly move on. So, As Brexit continues to confuse us and stagnates and paralyzes the British political system, a quarter of our cabinet ministers uh, last week, they escaped to attend the World Economic Forum in Davos. Now, why does that matter? Well, apart from not resolving the, the Brexit issues, um, the theme of that week is, was uh, Globalisation 4.0. And I've taken a quote from their literature that says that Globalisation 4.0 is driven by the fourth industrial revolution, which is introducing technologies at a speed and scale unparalleled in history. So we're really relevant. As we sit here today, we could not be more relevant in the topics that we're discussing. Um, the event you know, is well attended. Uh, we've got live streaming going on. Uh, over the course of the day, we'll have about 60 people from industry. And this has all been done at fairly short notice. So clearly, major interest, and rightly so, in this topic. OK. I'd like to begin my introduction by talking about economic growth, or actually the lack of it. It has been reducing. And the, the global economy has really stopped growing, and it's been declining for the last 50 years or so. So what we see here is the, the, the growth slowdown. It's the percentage annual growth rate in real GDP per capita over 10-year periods for the USA. So over 50 years, there's been a decline in economic growth. So what has been the reaction to this from the, from the markets, from, from the money people? They've essentially created false growth bubbles. For example, the dot-com boom and crash in 2000, the housing market bubble, the mortgage derivatives, and the crash in 2008. And just now we've got, well, you read about the car loans, uh, the car loan issue as well, creating perhaps another kind of bubble. Consumer, consumer debt has never been higher. So we've not really created any real economic growth. These have all been kind of false starts. And the impact of no growth is very serious. It leads to inequality in society, policies around protectionism, tension and conflicts, no or, or little investment in infrastructure, and services suffer like education, social care, and health. So economic growth matters a lot. And that's my first point. The second point is around um, how do we get economic growth? What does history tell us? History tells us that major economic growth comes from an increase in production capacity. And there have been three major historical examples. The first was in the 18th century, based in Manchester, the first industrial revo revolution, around coal power, steam engines, and the, uh, the uh, infrastructure around canals and railway, all for the cotton mills. You can still see the relics of the, the buildings and the structures around the city today. So that was in the 18th century. That led, obviously, with the mechanisation of the steam power, led to an increase in production capacity and economic growth. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you now at Industry 4.0 in action. Um, as announced, what is my task for today is rather, or hopefully I'm able to inspire you, what discussions might come up during the coffee breaks today, what aspects should be in the discussions on the later on aspects talk. So uh, when I got the invitation, we were thinking about a Kai. So now since Industry 4 is now talk of the town for quite a year meanwhile, uh, and I've been working on the topic since 2013, um, it would be nice to provide you with kind of a field report on our experiences and success factors in doing so. So from my background, my daily job is to consult our customers at Bosch and the industrial branch at Bosch Rexroad 
on IIoT solution architecture. So technology-wise, I'm more into connectivity stack from edge to cloud. Um, nevertheless, uh, as you can assume in such a big organization as Bosch, the community is also quite big. So what I was thinking about for today is not so much giving the pitch on all our solutions. So if you are interested, feel warmly welcome. Also my UK colleagues are with me. I want rather to share some few on what from my perspective is state of the art. So from all you guys coming from academia, take this, what I show is that is given. You are the ones for the steps beyond that. Um, and for the industrial community, I would simply like to share some few, some important aspects from my experience to, um, to type that topic with the right twist. Um, so let's see, firework is about to start. If the presenter is also with us, second try. No? There, there's also one there, but otherwise I just stay with my left, that's also fine. Oh, oh. It's blinking, blinking, blinking. Yeah, there we go. All right, um, so as mentioned before, um, when we are speaking about Industry 4, normally we are speaking about a bunch of technologies ranging from additive manufacturing to blockchain to AI to IoT, uh, all of them driven by and um, quite a exciting development of technology. So we are speaking about having by 2020 7 billion people connected and furthermore 50 billion devices connected. And so now speaking to a group of people that are rather coming from the industrial domain, if I refer to the industrial IoT, of course we are one of the domains where we have to evaluate the potentials of these kind of technology. So first of all, when I step into that topic, the first thing is I, I put the big disclaimer that we really have to be careful to not implement technology just as a segment itself. Like you name it, whether you call the topic industry four or the industrial IoT or digitization, digitalization, digital transformation, uh, it ends up that you have to evaluate the potential. So from an innovation manager's point of view, it's a, it's a technology push as the last three industrial revolutions have been before. So we have to evaluate what's in for us. And when we take a look at that, so why should we actually care about Industry 4.0? We come up with rather conventional points because since we're business guys and guys from production, we end up uh, with those five pillars that have been known before because everybody who drives a business wants to gain transparency first of all because when you want to control a business you have to be aware on your KPIs, you have to be aware of what you are doing that you can control accordingly. We are a really hard benchmark uh, whether we really fulfill a benefit and so in this concrete case what we see is that even in the value stream that is already kind of optimized they still were able to reduce their stock by 30% and increase the output by 10%. So these are those hard return of invest figures you have to provide when you come up with an IoT solution. So again, like emphasizing the point, always start with the use case when you discuss the topic. That's always my first question. Before I come to perspective number two, technology. So now I could speak for hours about technology and I'm very well aware now being in the audience where also many guys are rather from the additive manufacturing point of view at home. I have many colleagues dealing with robotics. Depending on what is your concrete technology background, you can spend hours in discussing and elaborating on that. Um, so for me, as mentioned, I just brought along some design aspects, especially when it comes uh, to um, doing connectivity stacks, so how to actually network devices among themselves. Hi, I'm Tim Butters. I'm a Head of Research and Development at Sabisu. So we're a Manchester-based software company that work with data in the process industries. I'm Victoria Monte. I am Sector Head for Industrial Automation at Gambica, which is the UK's trade association for uh, industrial automation technology, technologies and process instrumentation and control. This is a long one. Test and measurement and lab tech. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Parkinson. I lead education engagement for Autodesk. Uh, Autodesk are based in California. We produce software for people who make things. 
Hi, I'm Dave Chalmer. I lead the automation team at Airbus Broughton in the UK. Um, I sit within the manufacturing technologies department, which is responsible for industrial technologies such as drilling, fastening, machining, uh, forming, and traditional uh, mechanical engineering type uh, disciplines. So, hi again, Jeanette Ulte, IoT Solution Architect at Bosch. Now, I'm kind of upset that I'm only a mechatronics engineer. <laughs> 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 so petrochemicals, chemical production, and generally they don't talk specifically about Industry 4, but they, they call it digitization and digitalization. Um, I think that's one of the issues of the terminology. Yeah, the concept's exactly the same, they just don't refer to it as, as I4. Um, for them, it's, it's about taking processes that are maybe manual at the moment and making them more automatic. Um, that's a, a huge part of it. For, for the process industry because there's still a lot of manual measurements taken, things like that. But looking to the more interesting stuff, the, the reason to do that is to try and get this nice big data set that's quite varied. And all the systems you might have on the planet, so process data, but also log files, um, purchase orders, and then to be able to do something with it. And that's something they would like to do is gather insights that help them optimize the process, improve safety, and try and make better spec products for, for less. It's, it's all around that, that sort of area, um, and that's what we try to, to help them do. So it's very much like a, a data analysis, data focus, certainly from, from my role in the company. Um, but that's what we see in terms of industry. Do you see your role as a, an industry core role, or is it, is it, is it wider than that? It's, so personally, um, my role, if, and you know you can put it all under the umbrella of industry core, because industry for is, is quite broad. And if you're talking about um, data analysis and insight, um, then that's from a, an R&D perspective is, is what I do within the company is trying to take that data and, and do something with it that adds value in some way. So yeah, I would say it fits within industry for. I think it ties in with one of your slides earlier, Jeanette, about the, uh, you know, looking at the pump and looking at the maintenance schedules and so what you've been doing, I guess, in oil and gas, but it's in yeah, that I, kind of monitoring. Well, I saw that it's a, we have a very, very similar use case, I'm sure, a different kind of one, but that's, that's exactly the kind of stuff that, that people want and need at the moment, yeah. Great. Uh, Victoria? Um, so, as we're a trade association, um, I represent the com companies who make industrial automation technology, like Siemens, uh, Bosch, and, um, and others. Um, and we're so, also members, uh, yeah, yeah. We also have a uh, university sector, so uh, Manchester, very proud member. Um, so um, my particular uh, interest is that you can't really talk about um, industrial automation anymore without talking about Industry 4. I mean, there is a certain push um, in the UK to get people to automate their, their processes, but um, increasingly, you know, just by the nature of technology and how they're transforming it, um, you can't have that discussion without talking about Industry 4. Uh, yeah, hi. So, um yeah, we don't necessarily use the term industry at all. Um, however, we have some knowledge which we call the future of making, um, which is essentially the automation between design and make. Um, and if you were to package the future of making and turn it into a, a degree program, then we feel that you'd have something like some virtually identical to the MSc in industrial digitalization. And then also chucking into the fact that you've got all these technologies and democratization happening. We've also got these students on this program, uh, which represent uh, the fact that we've got digital natives, these, this new breed of workforce, the future engineers coming through, which are adding to that disruption. 
Um, so working yes, between, that's yeah, yeah, this I is really, yeah, absolutely. <coughs> so this is quite unique. What's happening at Manchester Metropolitan from the universities that I certainly work with across Europe, um, in the sense that you've got typically I work with mechanical engineers, work with uh, industrial design programs, that type of thing. What's really fascinating, what's happening here is it's come from all different disciplines, and you've got like, an explosion, and then uh, from that the output is this course. So yeah, I think that's interesting. That point around the future of making, maybe making it more of a start of that comment around the definition uh, where people maybe can relate to that maybe a bit more than industry 4.0 what is that and is it something people can grasp onto is it yeah i think sort of in a nutshell the three points of the future making are the means of production are changing uh, the customer demand is changing and the products themselves are getting smarter and uh, there's a lot of people in industry who are quite scared of that prospect and they're not prepared for it um, and i guess the question is you know, with regards to students and education is do you embrace them um, or like, do you get disrupted by them um, and I think that's a great, great point and what this course is really answering that. And I think that's something we want to make sure we focus on today. Yeah. Uh, do you guys when you leave that you see some insights maybe from an industry core perspective that you can maybe integrate into your existing projects to strengthen your CVs and understand what I guess companies are looking for as well. So, uh, sorry, yeah so I think for me as, we, as I said earlier we we have quite a lot of what we would call sort of heavy industrial automation assets within Airbus. We're at the point with the type of design architecture that we have in aircraft where we may be at saturation point where we've identified all of those heavy assets, we've, we've automated those processes already. And we're now looking for new ways really to disseminate what we brand as light automation within our, within our business. So that could be things like cobots, um, things like robots working maybe not on the product but in manual activities to, to one side in preparation work preparation and that type of thing so i think as, a, as an automation team we see the business benefits and the continued incremental improvement coming from that type of that type of automation but also the digital aspects that we can extract from our existing automation assets so when the well is maybe somewhere close to dry enough in terms of delivering big benefit with big heavy automation but we see that through the sorts of things that in the in the Bosch presentation earlier we can use machine learning we can use data extraction we can do predictive maintenance we can find where we have inefficiencies um, and also within the aircraft industry maybe for the first time in commercial aviation we're coming to the sort of production rates that would actually you would maybe even call mass production in the past it's been more batch production the business case to invest in automation hasn't always been there and that's still a challenge um, so we're looking at ways with high production rates on single aisle aircraft programs where we need to become more efficient less manual more repeatable and we see industry 4.0 even though we don't call it industry 4.0 either what, what um, do you call it we're in the language of digitalization um, connected manufacturing connected industry Exactly. We're doing Industry 4.0, maybe we don't brand it under one umbrella, we don't have an Industry 4.0 team, uh, but we're doing it in little ways all around the business. <laughs> also, you know, coming back to that dual strategy I showed before, um, now being part of this provider side of the more strategy of thinking about what can we offer to the market, um, it's uh, it's my daily business to be part of the process to explore what are the use cases, also the upcoming use cases, and uh, how one might we solve them with regard to technology and, uh, and business. And that's a uh, very interesting point of mind because as shown in the videos beforehand, um, we start with a certain set of hard skills, but it's actually exploring what are the relevant pain points that I could solve and especially the interesting point is to have that disruptive potential, in my case even for my own organization, so where, where to embrace the change instead of getting lost with it. Yeah. Super. So I have this really, really cool job where I get to work with the UK research base, so whether that's universities, whether that's government research facilities uh, and other, other similar bodies, uh, so the cash costs, for example. Um, to see what technology is out there, to see how we can embrace that technology, it's a two-way thing, so we're obviously very interested in those guys knowing more about Siemens products and services. Um, but this is really to help a 170-year-old traditional manufacturing organisation that does move with the times, that does disrupt, but actually to get an advantage 
um, using the technologies that, that I guess we're going to be talking about and we've spoken about already this morning to see how we can get those to be filtered through Siemens as an organisation to make us future proof for, for, for the, the coming decades. We are a, I'm going to say we're a traditional So typically, over the years, when we go out for graduate recruitment, we have recruited the best engineers, the best people to come in and work for Siemens. Now, we still want to recruit the best engineers, but actually, I think we're looking for engineers with an additional something else as well. So we have our uh, industrial IoT platform. Um, what's really helped us this year is, is taking people in from the, with engineering degrees, but actually they've got some coding experience as well. They've got some design knowledge. So that when we have to produce applications and we need to build applications for our customers, whether they're proof of concept or whether they're in actual industrial product, pro projects, those guys can come in and actually, we don't need to spend as long training them. They can step up to the mark pretty, pretty quickly. And actually, if they've got additional skill sets, there are various um, ways that they can move within our organization as well. So they won't just be pitching holes into one area, they won't just be doing one job. And they can help to train the rest of the organisation as well. So I have, I have one fantastic graduate working for me at the moment who does exactly that. He, he's got a first class engineering honours, but in his spare time he's a, he's a coder. And in his spare bedroom in his house, this is probably very, very sad, apparently it's full of servers and computers <laughs> and screens and everything. You know, I don't want to be him, but actually I'm very grateful that I've got him working on my team as well. So additional skill sets as well. Quite interesting, I think, and it uh, taps into that that aspect that we can't just be I suppose you know, an expert in one thing. We need to have a, a range. Uh, is it something similar in the rest of you when you're with the yeah, I think hiring? Traditionally, for us, we, we have graduates. We also have internal apprenticeship schemes that that lead to you know to uh, B Eng level training. And traditionally, we focus on mechanical engineering, aeronautical engineering. But we don't necessarily design aircraft in our plants, we're a very industrial plant. So we're leaning more now towards data analytics skill sets, robotic skill sets, things that, things that will give us the advantage uh, in terms of integrating improvements to our existing assets, uh, rather than maybe conceptual design of the new aircraft. Um, it's around those new technologies that can actually make a difference with what we've got. challenge we have with our HR colleagues is at the moment that the typical profiles are not fitting anymore. Uh, but furthermore, I'm just coming back from discussion we had within my team since we're currently looking for a new colleague. Um, and like on the prior one topic was you're open-minded and happy to be an active member of an agile team. Um, so that, that whole set of soft factors, so that willingness to learn new things, uh, the willingness to work in cross-functional gets by far more important than the actual professional background you have, right? Like if I take a look at my daily schedule, only a very small portion of it is the hard skills I have taken from university. Of course, I take along like my ability to learn and the systematic way of working and the scientific way of working, but furthermore, like you have to have that certain mindset of working in this explorative way. And, um, I don't think that's said often enough. Um, you know, um, the question that's often asked, you know, what skills do we need in the future? And you say, yeah, there's going to be like, more interdisciplinary uh, courses like, like yours. Uh, it's great to see that you have uh, students coming back from you know, arts backgrounds and yeah. um, textiles and, and, and so on, so not just from engineering. I'm glad to say we've got colleagues from the business school and yeah, business and all faculty here today, and also it starts to show that yeah. you know, it's wider than engineering. And I, I don't, I think in the not too distant future, we will, um, it will be tough to come across a sort of a pure science degree in the future because you just can't demand that as sort of side based anymore. But the uh, lifelong learning thing, I don't think that's mentioned enough. I think the ability to learn, because technologies are changing so quickly at the moment, you know. I can say to your students, you all have to learn this. 
actually it's not that language, it's the ability to learn how to code. It's, yeah. it's you know, that seems because things change. So, um, yeah, I think the ability to learn is, is very important. Uh, something you mentioned, Dave, as well, is this, you know, uh, that skill set and actually embedding that then with other people in the organization. I know we've got colleagues from Dell in today, and they mentioned that you run reverse mentoring within your organization. And is that something you're doing at Siemens now as well, or is that becoming a wider thing now? That yeah, reverse yeah. Mentoring very much so, and it's a challenge that we face. You know, we have um, a, a lot of the people that we employ have been with the company all of their lives. You know, um, a lot of them are getting towards retirement age. Actually, you know, we still need those guys to to relearn, to reskill, and to skill up. I've, I've got a colleague, uh, you know him, so Alan Norbury, and he has a fantastic presentation, which is Alan's an apprentice in the 1970s, and he's got the big afro and the flares and everything, <laughs> and the sorts of work that he would be doing. Is um, uh, welding, soldering, banging stuff with a hammer, using a screwdriver, and, and so on and so forth. And then fast forward um, 40 plus years, and there's a picture of Alan, not with the afro anymore, um, <laughs> but you know, with the VR goggles on and everything like that. So a fantastic example of how we're changing. The problem is there's only one Alan. We need to bring you know sort of all the Alans up to that and everything. Alan Avatars. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so yes, there's, there's, there's a constant reskilling, um, re-education process that's required to adopt these new technologies. I think there's a period as well as kind of generational aspect as well, that, uh, and there's that challenge. And I think we've been speaking to some companies as well about you know, shorter courses, maybe for you know, people who've been in the company longer and might need that support on enhancing their digital skills. And I think I think there's a challenge to. to, to say me as well. So, you know, we, each, we, we walk into an organisation, we work for an organisation, and we think we know it all, and we don't uh, almost pay enough attention to the youth within our organisation and the adoption of trends that we don't maybe know about. Um, I, 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 apparently I'm not down for the kids anymore. <laughs> I've seen that from your tweets. I've seen that from your tweets. <laughs> no, so I, was, I was talking to one of the graduates the other day, and, um, and I thought I was making a joke. We were talking about CDs, compact discs, and I said CDs are what we used to have before we had downloads. And my graduate came back straight away and said downloads are what we had before we had Spotify. Any other points on that? Or well, j just to just to sort of add to what everyone's already sort of said there, and we. I certainly know that um, at, at Autodesk we, we, we create software, okay, and that's the tool set. And then a, a layer above that we've got the skill set, which we've spoken about there. I think we do need to mention that actually Autodesk is different. We don't directly employ people as such, but we have a lot of customers who take a lot of graduates in every year. And what they're looking for is that mindset. So you've got the level of tool set, skill set, mindset. I think that's what's extremely different. And a couple of examples of that are we've got a program called the Future of British Manufacturing Initiative, which is specifically aimed at SMEs, so small businesses there, who are struggling with digitalisation. Um, and examples from that include, so typically a student would go on a work placement and we, we, we call that in the Future of British Manufacturing Initiative uh, a digital catalyst. And traditionally, a student would go on to a work placement, um, they'd probably you know, sweep the floor, wash, make cups of coffee, learn from that person who's done the job for 40 years. What the Digital Catalyst program does is actually the student take in the, the skill set and the tool set, which they're a digital native, they've already got that, with the mindset and they look to innovate in that company. We've got examples there of students going into industry and, and reducing workflows by 75% and making companies more profitable, making companies more innovative and productive. And I think that's really, for me, the power of what young people can do now. So, any questions from the audience at this stage, or anyone want to chip in? Yeah. Steve, Steve you, want, you want to get the mic? You just pass that on. Hi, uh, Steve Jones from Liverpool John Moores University. There's a lot of work going on at the moment. We've got industry and academia trying to bring the two together, particularly with industry trying to help academia to, to understand and embody the, you know, the industry 4.0 concept into its curriculum. And we're seeing this going to curriculum. I just wanted to ask the panel, um, what, what do they think is missing at the moment from the, 
curriculum at universities and, and the sector delivers, and, and also even more crucially, what can they offer? What can the industry offer to academia? What would they suggest that we can help really do? Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I go to a lot of universities, and um, what I see is traditionally you come from a mechanical engineering program. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the degree that probably people would associate. That's it. And what I see there is a, is a lot of mechanical engineering degree programs from very, very well established universities where students aren't actually engaging with anything electronic, anything microcontroller based, or anything like that. And then they're leaving a program with a first class honours degree. Um, yet they've done nothing digital. And I think we're missing a massive opportunity there. Um, I think that's a key part of that, uh, for, from what I see. And it varies, but on the whole, um, I was quite surprised, John, you know, just working with universities, just maybe how um, outdated some of the thought processes were there. Yeah. Um, maybe, uh, sorry, and a lot of the mechanical engineering programs probably are still the same curriculum as what your colleague was on as well. It's quite interesting to see that. Yeah, so so in, in the UK we work with uh, well in the UK, Germany, uh, North America, Japan, China. We work with ten leading universities in each of those focus countries, and we're looking for something different from those universities. We're not just looking for any university. We're not looking for league tables. We're not looking at anything like that. We're looking at universities that are beginning to disrupt the way the future of making is going to emerge. Uh, hence the reason for working with Manchester Metal Lab, who are really leading the way with Print City and with. Program, which to my knowledge is probably the first in Europe to do anything like this. That's uh, as far as we know. As far as we know, it's certainly, certainly yeah. far as I know. I don't know if you know. If you look at the UK list in the UK, it's yeah. probably one with that title. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so uh, Gambica, um, you know, um, we come from obviously from a completely different perspective, but um, something that I experienced uh, a number of a couple of years ago was. Um, I had my members, so with my Siemens and my um, Bosch and uh, my Rockwell Automations, and saying we can't find people for these jobs. We're really, really struggling to employ these people. And then on the other hand, you have these uh, graduates coming out of university and they can't get jobs. So you know, it's all that can be a disconnect. So um, we set up the university sector within Gambica, um, and uh, Carl will be very supportive of that. And uh, the idea of that is to take what we do at Gambica, which is the form of consensus centres within an industry. So it's great that um, individual companies interact with the universities and they go and say, well, we need this and, and so on. But you're seeing that, that company's issue and you're not seeing the whole of the industry's issue. So the idea of, of having a university sector is that we get an industry consensus of you know, what is missing, what is missing from um, the industrial automation sector, what is missing from you know, the wider digitalisation and so on. And then we can share that them together with universities, not just one university, but you know, um, British universities, anybody who wants to join, they're more than welcome to. Um, and uh, and you get that, that direct, it, it's not the Siemens point of view, it's not the Bosch point of view, but it's the industry point of view, and you get get better engagement that way. I think, so, I don't know if you said it or, or you heard <coughs> Scott at some point about uh, with the university memberships that you have now, that your members were very excited yeah. to have, and I guess I would assume that people would openly Some universities, um, sorry, some um, companies are very good at you know going particularly to local universities who they you know have um, contacts with and saying you know have you thought about having this in your curriculum? But I don't think many companies are, um, and particularly if um, they don't have a manufacturing base here, so they're looking for something that they're not looking for something for the manufacturing thing. They're looking for something special. They're looking for it. Um, I don't know, but pure business, and, you know that sort of thing. Um, so yeah. That, So I had uh, one member um, say, oh, oh, could I, could I send, um, we, we're looking for some graduates, can I email the university? So I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. Except that then they didn't send me the stuff, but that's <laughs> beside the point. But it, it, it allows that sort of um, greater engagement, but on mass. 